Welcome to the RTB YouTube live stream. It is sponsored by the Scholar Community here at Reasons to Believe. And we have a special program today. Before I introduce our guests, I want to tell you that this is a first of a series of webinars we're going to be presenting that really engage in some important principles. Uh, at Reasons to Believe, we talk about the golden rule of apologetics, treat other people's beliefs the way you want yours treated, meaning treat them accurately, fair-mindedly, maybe even deferring to giving the benefit of the doubt if you can. And we also talk about the idea of truth, unity, and charity. Embrace the truth. Truth is a sacred thing. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But we also need to think about unity. Jesus prayed to his Father that his church would be one as he and the Father were one. And of course, Paul tells us that we have faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So we're, we're going to be talking to a variety of people who represent different science faith organizations. And today, we have a special opportunity because we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and the Christian worldview, but we're also going to be introducing our guest, uh, J Dr. Josh Schwamadas. He's going to be dialoguing with my colleague here, Dr. Jeff Swearink. And uh, there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you get in the chat box, the last 30 minutes of the program, we're going to take your questions. So make sure you are on top of that. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Josh, it's wonderful to have you here as a visiting scholar. Uh, I just met you the other day. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you guys have been a great host. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, the way we'll approach this topic is I'd like to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes talking about the two organizations, where we agree, where we may disagree, what are some of the distinctive features. Then we'll give 40 minutes to a topic I know everybody's interested in, artificial intelligence. You work directly in that mm -hmm. field. You've written a book on the topic. And then we'll take a, a period of uh, questions and answers. So, Josh, I'm going to start with you. You represent an organization called Peaceful Science. Tell people who you are, your background, what peaceful science is, and some of the distinctive features of it. Yeah, so I'm a scientist in the church. Um, I'm a Christian uh, in science, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's kind of been where I've been, like this weird <laughs> place between the Christian world and, and the scientific world. I'm a professor at Washington University in St. Louis. And most of what I do in, in my time is actually just applying artificial intelligence to solve problems at the intersection right. of biology and chemistry. And um, in medicine, that's what I've done. I mean, I have a medical degree, too, and a PhD in computer science. And so that's what I've been doing for really 25 years. Wow. Uh, but then about, um, about eight years ago, I kind of ended up getting sucked into the origins conversation, <laughs> uh, which is a really contentious uh, debate um, and conversation, as you know about it. It had been part of my personal um, kind of, uh, you know, journey in terms of being, you know, starting out being raised as a young earth creationist, moving to more old earth creationism. And then really coming to see some validity in evolutionary science, too, but still really keeping a lot of the, you know, the theological commitments that mm -hmm. old earth creationists have um, during that time. So, that, so, so that's kind of how I got into there, even though that wasn't my primary area of study. Mm -hmm. and, um, very, so it's the origin of humanity that really you focused on. Yeah, well, for me, when I, um, when I struggled through this stuff, like, you know, there's ways to think about animal evolution and plant evolution fairly easily aligned with scripture. Mm -hmm. the, the harder part was how do you reconcile Genesis 2, where it talks about mm -hmm. God kind of creating Adam and Eve out of the dust, and how do you make sense of that? that, that and, and, I, and that's not just me who thought that. I found out when I started to read more about other thinkers, that was like the, the speed bump for a whole host of Christians that, you know, I mm -hmm. respected. And, and like, if not for the issue of human evolution, it probably wouldn't be as difficult. So, so that's where I was starting to spend a lot of time thinking about that personally and then just finding out how important that was for seekers and then really realizing, hey, um, this is a place that was really a place of pain that's really become a place of confidence, and it's probably starting to become a place that I'm going to be serving the church mm -hmm. um, out of this. And so that's, that's um, how I got in involved there. And, but then the strangest thing happened. It was surprising to me that I found out some of the people most supportive of my work uh, were atheists. Hmm. Really? 
atheist biologists, yeah. Um, people like Nathan Why Lentz. So? Why yeah. so? Well, I think that they um, – well, I think I'd been told that scientists were very anti-Christian. Mm. I found out that wasn't exactly what was going on. Is that they felt it was more that they felt really attacked by Christians, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't understand where they were coming from, mm -hmm. especially biologists. And you know, this is kind of like in the post um, Dover trial era, too. Like, right. I mean, <laughs> and 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 when they encountered me, they they found out, hey, this is a person who's actually taking the time to engage with and listen. He understands and actually sees a lot of validity in where we're coming from. And he's explaining this in a way that. On the one hand, is really upfront. He's being truthful that he is really a Christian too, mm -hmm. and that he believes that Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> right. And also, he's he's being truthful to um, those uh, those Christians over there and talking to them about why he affirms evolution and how mm -hmm. he's thinking about that, and that can actually do a lot of good. So, you know, even Nathan Lentz um, and, and a couple other secular scientists, it wasn't just him, uh, you know, endorsed my book. Right. Okay. That's I don't know of really <laughs> any other book written by Christians about Adam and Eve that got endorsed by atheists. And what really struck me is that these are people that are made in the image of God, that were becoming very good friends, that were taking professional risks to, to support my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. And I was thinking, man, there's no organization in Origins. There's no camp that includes them, too. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. And so that was really uh, one of the primary reasons why I, you know, I kind of formed – you know, peaceful science, mm -hmm. um, which was really meant to be not oriented about a particular position in the origins debate. I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm very public about that. But peaceful science itself is, um, you could see it either secular or ecumenical very broadly. We work with Muslims. We work with Jews. We work with, you know, um, atheists. We'll work with Hindus if they want to talk mm -hmm. with us too. And it's a place where, um, you know, people um, like these allies that were atheist scientists could come be a part of what we're doing there as like full equals, not kind of mm -hmm. as like yeah. secondary people. Gotcha. And I found out that, that they are real uh, – I mean there's just a lot of space for common ground and that, that that's really kind of what that grew out of. And so there's a lot of good things that came out of that. Uh, one is, you know, we found language to explain, um, you know – what our purpose and mission and values are that, that non-Christians were getting excited about and it was completely aligned with where we, I was as a Christian. <laughs> as people or as peaceful science? Well, as peaceful science. As peaceful science. Yeah, okay. but it's, yeah. it's what I'm personally aligned with as okay. a Christian. But then atheists could look at that and say, I'm really aligned with that too. Okay. <laughs> and so like, um, like I said, we're not oriented around any particular position on origins. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that we want to include that even are, you know, you know, questioning evolution. That's not the point. It's mm -hmm. not like you have to agree with us on that. But rather, one of the things that we do is we, we say we want to really focus on questions mm -hmm. right. rather than answers and uh, and really uh, and really go after the grand question, which is, you know, what does it mean to be human? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're caring about. That's why uh, we're dealing stuff in human origins because it brings us to that question of what it means to be human. Yeah. And that's why also we care about um, artificial intelligence too, right? Because <laughs> right. I think the, the, the reasons why uh, the conversation on AI is so interesting right now is that it's causing us to think about and rethink and think more deeply about this question of what it means to be human. Agreed. Now, Jeff, you're an astrophysicist. R tell us about reasons to believe in light of maybe what Josh has shared. Well, there's a, a number of similarities I see is that, uh, you know, I'm a, a Christian who you know, I grew up in the church, uh, have been interested in Christianity. I mean, it's a major part of my life, um, but also have been uh, interested in science from as young as I can remember. And, you know, one of the things that really attracted me to reasons to believe was that it was one that said, hey, we can take seriously Christianity, but science is, we can also take very seriously. And you know, I would characterize that now as that Christianity is focused on understanding God's special revelation, and science is kind of focused on understanding God's general revelation, and they hold both of those in high regard. That's really what I find So the, the most two books metaphor. Two books metaphor. So reasons to believe is a ministry has a very similar focus of how do we help people see that science is not an enemy of the Christian faith, but is actually a tool to engage people in Christianity in the way they don't. Because I, you know, I grew up in an era uh, where largely many Christians I knew thought science was antagonistic towards Christianity, and many scientists I knew thought Christianity was antagonism antagonistic towards science. And so it was really just saying, 
no, that's not a choice you have to make. In fact, as we study this world, we find evidence that what Scripture reveals about this world lines with what we see, that it's got a beginning, that it's, you know, Big Bang cosmology lines up with the biblical description. There's design in the universe. There's reasons to be skeptical about the evolutionary theory in terms of a complete explanation of humanity. And there, there's a whole great long discussion in what that actually means. But we can now, rather than science be this thing that we have to, as a, as a church, be, well, we got to be careful about that. It's like, no, this is a tool we can go out and use to engage the community because, and this is, date me a little bit, science was kind of the E.F. Hutton of the day. You know, if science said, people listened. And so it was just a great way to engage people with the gospel that might not otherwise consider the gospel in the way it was traditionally being presented. Question for both of you. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence in light of the Christian worldview. Worldview, a, a grand narrative. One way of thinking about a worldview in the, in the Christian context is that there are these four successive events, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, issues that come out, um, creation ex nihilo. Is that mm -hmm. something both of you would agree, that God called all things into existence out of nothing? Yeah. <laughs> Given our discussions, I would be surprised if we disagree. I mean, I think in a lot of that. ways, like I think I'm – so I've been a hard person for people to characterize in a lot of ways because I affirm evolution. I, I see no problem with biological human evolution. But I hold, you know – a theological view that's far more similar to reasons to believe, frankly, mm -hmm. than, you know, biologos. And so that that's like a weird thing how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Could I ask a question about that? Because I've I've noticed in the roughly two decades I've done been engaged in apologetic work, it seems like there are some people when they come from a young earth creationist to an old earth creationist view, how they look at scripture changes pretty dramatically. Was that something that characterized you or not? Well, yes and no. So I'd say the majority of people kind of like in that, you know, progressive Christianity or evolutionary creationist crowd, they have um, – they, they were – if they've kind of moved – a lot of them are post-evangelical, not all, but some of them are. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is kind of having experience with like the fundamentalist side okay. uh, of, of the evangelical church, um, if that makes any sense, and, uh, and really reacting to that by mm -hmm. kind of moving to, um, you know, taking the – Bible less literally, more right, myth okay. mythologically, and kind of, and, and many of them even like exiting the mm -hmm. e evangelicalism and going down more like the mainline or progressive path. Okay, that was it was very different for me. <laughs> for me, the reason why I left Young Earth Creationism is because I found out that uh, the, uh, probably the biggest thing for me is I found out that they had misrepresented to me what the historical positions of the church were. That's exactly why I asked the question because that's that's my. Uh, experience as well. It wasn't like, ooh, I had to look at it differently. It's like, I didn't get the whole picture of what Christianity yeah. had said. And so, the, and to be clear, this isn't all young earth creationists. There yeah. are some young earth creationists that are, that are um, you know, they're not, they're not the prominent ones, <laughs> not the ones that you typically hear that, that are not, that are approaching it in a more evangelical versus of a fundamentalist approach. But there's a lot that um, that they're claiming that the church has always been young earth creationists and then, you know, the only reason we're changing now is because all of this atheist science. That's just not true. Right, yeah. exactly. It, yeah. it's, it's not true. And and it's just like a history lesson. It's like this factual stuff. It's not about opinion. It has to mm -hmm. do with like what actually is in history and what are the things. I mean, what's the, what's the pattern of how the church has engaged with ideas from science? Um, and what are the, how we thought are the mm -hmm. things that are important and the things that are not, and are we trying to find ourselves to be continuous with that? And mm -hmm. once I realized that young earth creationism was not the approach that was most continuous mm -hmm. with historical Christianity, I, w I was gone. So, <laughs> so for me, like um, you know, a person kind of taking the more common path to affirming evolution, they're doing that often because they're just kind of walking further away from historical Christianity. Mm -hmm. yeah. For Let's me, move. it was historical Christianity I felt that rescued me from young earth Christians. Very good. Let's move to that second event, an end time and space fall. Mm -hmm. So Adam and Eve rebel against God. Uh, to, to, to whatever extent we understand it, all of humanity uh, is corrupted morally and those kinds of things. Is there an agreement here that there was a real in time and space fall by the first humans? Absolutely. <laughs> I think okay. that's a lot of what we're going to have. Uh, 
the challenges of artificial intelligence are directly related to that yes, fall. It is. It's the will we use the tool well. But. Now, w what about the origin of those human beings? Is it a de novo creation? Is it a evolutionary creation position? Well, I'd say that we should be open to the idea that they were chosen from a larger population, but historical Christianity has always held that they were de novo created, and there's no – I haven't heard any good reason to move away from that. Hmm. So I think that we we can affirm de novo creation. There's no reason not to. That, that, that's a little uh, – or compared to most evolutionary creationists, that's a – you, or a, a small, I don't want to say unique position, but it's a less common position. But I, I would affirm, well, before an RTB book, would affirm a de novo creation. Well, I mean, so I think before my book came out, um, most people, including people in the space like Reasons to Believe and Biologues, mm -hmm. didn't know what I was saying was possible. <laughs> Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And now that it's possible, it's kind of changed and moved the boundaries around to the mm -hmm. point where, I mean, uh, Fuzz and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, you guys aren't anti-evolution. Like, I mean, like you have your skepticism. You don't think evolution is the whole story. I certainly don't think evolution is the whole story, too. You have a model that doesn't have common descent. But um, but at the same token, you don't really see theological problems with what I proposed. <laughs> It's, at some it, level, that's true. Yeah, it's like you know the way I would describe it is at least in terms of what I see in Scripture, there is a created aspect, de novo creation, but there's also some process God has used. And the question yeah. in my mind is, what's the extent of the process? If it's all process, I think that's problematic. But there's clearly some de novo part. So yeah, I, 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 I think this <laughs> Sorry, is actually <laughs> really exciting though too, because I think several old Earth creationists have, I think over the last few years, um, in response, in large part to my work, but also Bill Craig's work, I think they've really done something very wise that's going to have a huge impact in the long run, of really expanding the tent of what old earth creationism is. Hmm, interesting. And to the point where the definitions that are being used, it's more about whether or not you affirm historical Adam and Eve right. <laughs> and a historical fall than whether or not you affirm or reject evolution. Like, that's kind of like a secondary tertiary thing. Like, Interesting. It's yeah. more about kind of, are you aligned with the, this part of mere Christianity, believing yeah, in a historical right. fall? So we've got creation ex nihilo. We've talked about historical Adam and Eve, a real end time and space fall. Now, how about redemption? Jesus Christ, the only savior of mankind, trusting in his death reconciles you to God? Well, yeah, Absolutely. of course. <laughs> and, okay. and not only that... <laughs> God made himself to know to all people, uh, you know, by raising this man, Jesus, from the dead. Bodily. Life, death, <laughs> resurrection of yes. Jesus Christ. Okay. I mean, that's, that's a lot of common ground. Biblical inerrancy. Yeah, we both affirm that. Yeah. Okay. And RTB is explicit about that in its in its statement of belief. Yeah, we'd have too. a lot of discussion about yeah. that too. Where um, you guys are way too nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's it's funny because it's there's a remarkable amount we agree on. Which, considering you come from an evolutionary creation position, that's well, often on tip. I, I, yes, I, I'll give you that. I'm hard to label, I'll grant that, but I, 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 I wouldn't say evolutionary creationist, but go fair, ahead. Fair point. It's the amount of agreement is much larger than normal in those two camps, I will say that. So well, I think, like, historically, it's just that if people who affirmed evolution really felt that science really pushed them to different theological positions. Yeah. And okay. I, I, I just. That has, I just don't think that that's true. Right. And I think that it's not science pushing them there. It's other things. And, I th I think and we're in the same spot I think that's an important position to make. It's that, you know, I, and as I became, I was a young earth creationist, became an old earth creationist. It wasn't changing my theological views at all. I mean, I still, there was nothing about inerrancy, the authority of scripture. That was all the same. It was just, oh, I was not told what Christianity had already said. <laughs> and so I, I think that's. I think that has implications for how we do our evangelism as well. So, Let's then move to this very provocative topic of artificial intelligence. People are very interested in it. They want to know what it is. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, Josh, you work uh, as a primary area of your occupation in the field of artificial intelligence. Why don't you tell us – Describe for us lay people what is artificial intelligence and, and why do you think it is so uh, interesting to people? 
Yeah, I'd say that, um, well, first of all, you asked, like, what is it? What is yeah. this thing? Well, I think the first thing to understand that is that it's not an it. It's, it, it's many things. Okay. <laughs> There's, like, a, a real plurality to it. There's many different aspects to it, and, and they're not all the same. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you know, some of them are fruits, some of them are vegetables, some of them are animals. It's, it's like they're mm. very, very different things. And if you think about it as just, like, a single thing and call that AI – you're going to you're going to have a hard time following what's happening that's the first thing so okay. we actually talk about which specific thing but what is it that binds all those together we could talk about that all of these very diverse things and the, historically it's been basically uh, things and tricks and strategies and examples where we've been able to get computers to do things that um, are usually can kind of been confined to human intelligence okay mm-hmm. so even just getting a computer program to be able to play chess is a type of AI in yeah. an important way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's other types of AI. There's there's a whole range of different types and approaches, but there's a particular type that's based on neural networks, which is creating, um, it's kind of inspired by how the human brain works and le- taking that to build the mathematical formula and then learning how to tune the weights of that. So it's a type of machine learning, which is kind of where I've specialized, mm-hmm. that has really turned out to be extremely powerful. Uh, right now, and it's solving problems and doing things now that a lot of us didn't know it was possible for computers to solve uh, before. Well, and it seems like a lot of that has been predicated on the tech, the the hardware kind of developing to a point. I mean, you know, you're you're dealing with very large amounts of tunable parameters. So, I mean, you know, the more you add parameters, the larger your memory gets, and also there's just an enormous amount of data to train it. And I think. What would you say has led to the this advent of this new way? I mean, what, what kept this from happening 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, well, I'd say that, well, 20, 30 years ago, it was really early on. I mean, I think that, that it's not just, some people kind of will tell the story, it's just because we have more GPUs now that, or like computers that we're able to do this. Yeah, I don't think that that's true. I think okay. that um, that's p- part of it, but, mm-hmm. um, but I think a uh, but there's been like several theoretical advances too, where you know if you take like a pretty um, if you take the neural networks that people are using in the 80s, they couldn't do what the ones that we're using are now. The ones we're using now are a lot more complicated in their structure and it's much okay. more precisely tuned. And because we figured out a whole uh, range of things, mm-hmm. um, and you know I can I can sit down and kind of show you the key papers and step through all of them to uh, where they're basically making the structure of these equations a lot more um, powerful and ability mm-hmm. to kind of work more efficiently and to be able to identify, um, you know, uh, really efficiently identify important patterns in the data. And so that, that's, that, so that, that's been a part of it mm-hmm. too. And it's all been, and I'd say another thing that's made it possible, it wasn't beyond just merely the hardware, is that uh, most of this was being done in academia or exclusively in academia in the 80s, but then mainly in academia in the early part of the 2000s. But in the um, mid-2010s, really major tech companies started to invest big time in it and putting open source stuff out there. Um, Like Google published TensorFlow, Facebook published Mm -hmm. PyTorch. I mean, and, and, and now you have, like, you know, serious resources being invested in making okay. this stuff work in a way that was still kind of paired with this open source academic effort. And I think that's no, what that kind of really laid the yeah. foundation. So now it's this technology is really powerful, but amazingly, no one actually owns. It's <laughs> it's really in all of these different companies. Yeah, that, that was part of the discussion we were having earlier today that kind of, you know, it, it caught my mind is that I think one of the concerns I have about AI especially kind of the way it's played out is it seems like there's a few companies that have it and it seems to be the investment to get in seemed large. And it, you know, the idea that it's actually not that way, that there's going to be lots of people who could get into it kind of takes a, or removes one of my concerns that it's going to be used as this tool that can be politically one side or the other could control things. It's just the, the field doesn't seem like it's going to play out that way because nobody really owns the technology at this point. Yeah, I mean, and right now, I mean, they're all incentivized. Like, we have, like, Microsoft, mm-hmm. Google, and OpenAI, uh, and there's more, too. You know, there's right. Facebook is involved in this. They all have, like, competing programs because they know that there's a lot of money in this right now. So that's right. actually really good. It's really good 
you know, for society, that type of competition, because yeah. it, it isn't going to be something that's owned by one company in the long run. Right. Now, deep philosophical question, is this really an intelligence source? That is, is it sentient? I mean, I listen to some of these dolls and they talk. Uh, is this is this technology mimicking human thinking or is it actually real intelligent thinking? So that's a great question and we have to start making some more precise distinctions. So let's try and do that. So uh, there's a lot of things that we've kind of conflated together that I think one, it's, it's really interesting about what AI is doing. It's kind of teasing out and showing that these are maybe distinct things. So um, first of all, what do we mean by intelligence, right? There's many ways to differently think about that. And uh, we've generally thought that if it's a general intelligence, then it's going to have a mind. That's kind of like a conflation that people mm -hmm. put together. But I'd say that actually what we see in things like ChatGPT, which is one of the big large language models that people have been playing with, I think we're seeing a general intelligence that is not sentient. So, so it doesn't just, have a mind, yeah. right? And so that's surprising. So, so it's a general intelligence, but I don't mean general intel intelligence as sentience, just mm -hmm. that it's not um, a specific AI tuned to a particular right. task. Yeah. It is. It really understands a large body of human knowledge, and it has basically solved, I would say, the the natural language problem to be able to to communicate. And this mm -hmm. is a big surprise because a lot of a lot of philosophers thought you needed to have a mind in order to be able to master language. Mm -hmm. But now we're finding out that maybe you don't have to have a mind <laughs> to well, master that, language. That that seems to follow out of a number of AI accomplishments, and the one specifically that I would think of is. You know, the kind of the thought was, oh, if we could get an AI that would play chess as well as humans, then you'd have true general or you know, true intelligence there. And you know, that happened in 1996, and promptly they dismantled the computer the next day. I mean, it, you know, it's it's it accomplished the purpose, but it wasn't human intelligence. It was it was an accomplishment, and clearly something remarkable. But it was this that that I would argue was a much narrow focus text that. It did the task, but it didn't do what humans do, if you will. And I, I think that's interesting well, to what you're saying about these is that what we language kind of had that same thing. It's like we thought a mind would require for language, and it, and it kind of isn't. It's, you can do language without a mind. Yeah, so this is a little – once again, I want to make some distinctions here. So you say mm -hmm. it can't do what humans could do, but we should specify what is a specific thing that it can't do because it could do something. It could do chess, right? <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah. So that's something that Better than do. me, by the way. Yeah, and also the, the that, that happened fairly mind. early in the 60s, I think, or maybe even the 50s, like the very first chess programs came out. So that, yeah. that – Well, where it could so be the grandmaster. Like grand yeah, but, yeah. But, but, you know, but the, th the point is that that was like a very specific sort of thing. Right. It could solve mm -hmm. chess, but it couldn't do backgammon. Right. It couldn't do poker. It couldn't do anything. Thing, mm -hmm. um, other than just chess. That's where right. I got dismantled because there's only so many times you need to build a computer <laughs> to beat Kasparov, right? Right. Um, <laughs> well, kind of once. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's, what's different about ChatGPT is that, it was, it, that it's not trained for really any particular task. Mm -hmm. And you can throw a whole range of tasks, even tasks that you invent, to, and it's the first time it's ever been asked to do that. And it'll do things that are pretty reasonable. And this is the part. And I think it's a way that's saliently similar to how humans think, where I can just sit down and tell you, hey, can you do, can you try and figure out how to sing me a song in the tune of, I don't know, a Taylor Swift thing that's okay. about reasons to believe? Now, okay, that take, that's a little complicated, but you sit down, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. And you could, you could probably figure out how to do that. You might have to get a little bit of help, right? It turns out that something like that, um, ChatGPT can do really easily. Um, it just, mm -hmm. it can do that. And even though it wasn't built for the purpose of being able to do that, to become like the next weird Al Yankovic, that's not what actually yeah. it was designed to do. Um, it just can. And, and there's, um, in AI field, when it comes to uh, uh, large language models, what people have found is that um, the way how you prompt um, how you ask your question is really important to how it actually performs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found out is in almost every you know task that you give it, if you just give it a few examples of the right the right answer of like what the problem is and what the right answer is, it'll do really a lot better. 
Right. Okay. And so it's called few shot learning. Mm-hmm. But once again, that's exactly how it works with humans, where I can sit down with you, give you a totally new task you've never done, but you have, you know, if you understand English and you can read numbers and all that, I say, look, take these documents, and this is what I want to see you extract mm-hmm. from it. Let me give you a couple examples. Now, can you go do that on this one? And you'll probably be able to do it. That's exactly how ChatGPT is working, which is pretty phenomenal. So, I mean, you know, just to explore this idea a little bit. So, you know, with, with chess, okay, so you can do that chess. That's a narrow intelligence. It's a specific task. So you could, you could make an argument that it's able to do things related to language, that that's what it's designed to do. So anything related to language it can do. Can you teach it to play chess or diagnose uh, problems on a car or something like that? Is that... Is that in the wheelhouse of what ChatGPT or these large language models could do? Well, so those turn out to be really easy things to solve. So um, the hard part has always been the language aspect, the natural right. language aspect. And so um, one of the things that's – and, like, if you get, like, the pro version of ChatGPT and also if you look at, um, like, some of the libraries out there like uh, DSPY and Marvin, uh, what happens – what they're doing is they're actually kind of taking that language modeling system and they're hooking it into other back-end things. Okay, and they're da- describing those backend things with just natural language. So um, you can, for example, take a ChatGPT and then uh, s- and say, well, you know, if you if it makes sense, you can call um, any one of these functions over here. And one of those functions could be, uh, you know, see what the diagnostic code is that's coming out of of the car, <laughs> right? And, and do all that, and then it can make a call to that and say, oh, I want you to call that and tell me what what actually you get back out of that. Or it could be on the level of um, you know, use this chess program to find out what the next chess move is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you, and like I said, this would be described in natural language, and it would tell you in natural language in a way that's like parsable, actually computer readable, but also natural language. Yeah, I want you to go take it, it, it run this function mm-hmm. and find out. And so then it ends up becoming like a hybrid system. So it's really easy now to make systems like this that have really high um, function in specific tasks. Well, so but, but that- it's steered, by, it's being steered by natural language. No, it, and what, that seems to corroborate what I'm saying here is at some level that it – I mean, not to minimize that doing natural language is really – you know, it's, it's an impressive accomplishment. I, no way diminishing that. But it doesn't seem like it can go learn things outside of that realm. If, if it can be language, it can do it. But if it's not language, it can't. And so that's – that does seem to be one aspect of a general intelligence – that I can do things that require language, but I can also do things that require touch or smell, or I don't have to translate them into language to do them. And so, I'm how would you? What, so what are the your thoughts touch there? and smell one is hard, but vision is there. So um, that's actually one of the things that's really interesting about some of the newer models. Too, is that, is that part they're of not Chat just GPT, or is that something where it's a hybrid with something else? You know, so right now, the Chat GPT four is a multimodal model that okay. works with natural language and also images. It can generate images, but it can also look at and understand okay. a lot of the stuff in an image. So. Um, I mean, it's not perfect. It's still, but it's right, also yeah. it's a moving target. Things are changing, right? So, so, so it, it can just, actually just for clarity, is that something where I mean, I know they've done. There are AIs that do image recognition and describing. So, is it kind of pairing those, or is that? I'm just kind of curious. The some of the technical is it taking Chat GPT and extending it to do that, or is it taking one of these others and pairing it with Chat GPT? Or so on the technical side. Um, there's we don't know all the details because ChatGPT is a closed model, but there are some others. And the typical way it's done is, is that you can, um, without specifying what the internal representation is precisely, you can you can enforce that or encourage the network to have like a correspondence um, in its internal representation mm-hmm. uh, between domains, okay, between text and images. That's how it can. So then it can look at images. And kind of be able to describe what's in the image, or look, okay. or kind of take a description and convert that into an image. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so, so there's a fluency in being able to do both. I mean, and, yeah. and it will grow over time in its capacity to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. And and so that, that's kind of like baked in. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, kind of like very well paired. I mean, like they're it's mm-hmm. the same system doing it. So it can do things that are like really. I mean, like if you told, I mean, asked me like um, you know ten years ago if this would be possible, I'd be thinking, well, maybe for computers, but maybe I don't know, like forty years from now, maybe <laughs> like, probably after I'm dead. You can give it a, like a like a like a meme, for example, mm-hmm. or an image that's funny, and ask it, "Why is this image funny?" Yeah, and it'll give you 
like a clear explanation of why that was a funny mm. thing. I like, oh, this juxtaposing this and that, <laughs> or you know, and, it, and it's the same. It, it's articulating it in a way that we would articulate it yeah. as well. It's not just making something up. Let, let me ask a layperson question: What is the potential here? I mean. Are we talking about self-driving cars? Are we talking about using AI in medical areas? Uh, is there going to be a brain-computer interface? I mean, what's, what is the realistic range that you think is possible? You, you said, hey, 10 years ago, I you know, wasn't sure. Where do you think we may be in 10 or 20 years? Um, I think we're going to see a pretty changed world um, just from the – reality that computers can handle natural language now in a way they couldn't. Mm -hmm. That's enough to ha cause dramatic changes. That's why people are investing so much money in it because it's going to, it's turning upside down the, the, you know, it's turning upside down, you know, the economy and like the way we're thinking about jobs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of jobs that you could just never imagine a computer doing where now you kind of think <laughs> it would really help. To well, have a computer well, that's one just kind of, I, I do a fair bit of computer programming for my job that I do at UCLA. And I've just been, you know, kind of peripherally watching, and it's like you can write, you can have computers that write pretty good computer code, which yeah. is a little <laughs> hilarious or ironic at the same, at one level. But you know, things that it used to take some a person to do, not only can I, I don't know the fact that the, these computers can do it and probably do it faster and more expediently than humans is is a remarkable thing. And, yeah, it, it is. Um, so l l you talked about the, a range of things. So, mm -hmm. so that I think it's going to have a huge impact, and it's way it's going to be very dramatically changing and restructuring society, both for good and for bad. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the thing about self-driving cars, that's been more of a specific intelligence. Um, I think what we found is that kind of what I – I mean, this is something that I would say that I kind of predicted – that um, but we'll see what happens. I mean, maybe someday we'll get self-driving cars, but I think kind of getting 80% there is a lot easier than getting all the way 100% there, <laughs> um, especially when you're dealing with liability and, and like the human life component on it. It turns out as you get more and more um, if, uh, advanced in your ability to, to drive a car, that makes the driver less and less engaged. Right. To correct yes. it when it needs to. So it actually yeah. becomes more and more dangerous to get it more effective until uh, presumably you get to points where it's good enough where it doesn't need driver correct correction. Right, right. But, you know, that, that now you can see the problem where this is yeah. really hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see the same problem in medicine. Um, but, uh, like, so medicine is a place where it is going to – and it is being used right now and it is going to be used more. I mean, one of my colleagues um, who I actually did my PhD with at UCI is now at Stanford who's doing um, work with ChatGPT in medicine. Mm-hmm. And he took uh, he took ChatGPT, and he asked it second year medical questions like on the, like like that are kind of like the first step of the USMLE boards. I mean, these are hard questions. These are questions that require you to understand, you know, four or five mm -hmm. uh, disparate facts that are not actually in the question itself. You have to be able to connect through them, and and then kind of give a reason to answer um, mm -hmm. about why you chose what you chose and, and why it's correct. And they took um, the answers that um, second year Stanford. Medical students, which are no, no, they're no jokes. They're, right. they're, they're like the smartest, some of the smartest medical students in the country, right? Um, answers to these questions. And they had ChatGPT do it. And they kind of had them scored and found that ChatGPT outperformed right. uh, the huh? second year medical students. <laughs> And so um, one of the ways it's being used now is that there's um, several products in development that are like near market or even at market where you could actually um, have like a phone there that your, your uh, doctor lays down when you ha he has a conversation with you. It mm -hmm. listens to the conversation it has with, with you and it has access to your medical record. And based on those two things, kind of pulls together a draft note to go into right. your record mm. yeah. that the doctor will then kind of review and, and put in. So it's going to have an impact. We'll get rid of a doctor. I, I don't think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> but yeah. it might make uh, it so doctors can see a lot more patients and have a lot yeah. more impact. Now, what about, uh, what about the negative side? I mean, uh, a lot of people have some very thoughtful people have raised questions about how this could potentially be used in the military. Would there be concerns about who controls it? Mm -hmm. Speak to that issue if you would. Well, if I, if I could just even before we move, I, I think okay. that's a great, great avenue. But even before we get to there, just on what we've been talking about, you know, the, the moment you've got self-driving cars, I think one of the things that we forget about is – that as we develop technology, we can use it as a tool, but we also need to pay attention to how it forms us. You know, yeah. you mentioned 
the better the cars get at driving, the less the driver pays attention. Now, there's other things that go along with paying attention that, you know, there's a whole slew of things. You know, you do get into a crash, you know, de dealing with a person who caused a problem is much different than dealing with an AI that caused a problem against me. But we tend, I mean, as I think as humans, we tend to be lazy. And so the better the AIs get, there's, there's a risk of us becoming, you know, of a, of it allowing us to form us to become lazier or more complacent or whatever. Uh, I'm curious, how you, wh what do you see as, how do we deal with that well as Christians? Well, um, this, this is actually connected to the direction you're going mm -hmm. down too. I think um, technology amplifies. And yeah. this isn't the first new technology we faced. And I think there's a common pattern. It amplifies, it amplifies the good and it amplifies the bad. And we're in the image of God, but we're also fallen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can be certain that AI is going to amplify our ability to do good, and it's going to amplify our ability to do evil. Right. <laughs> it, that's what that's what technology does. Um, so that that's that's what I think is going to happen. And so you can kind of think about how to mitigate that, and we have to think about how to handle it wisely, and maybe try and reduce it. But in the end, we still know that's going to be the case because mm -hmm. technology isn't usually something you can fully control. You talked about, you know, who's going to control this? Well, the reality is no <laughs> one's going to control this because it's kind of like trying to police, like, you know, the use of calculus. <laughs> it's, it's something that's, like, far more ubiquitous. Yeah, I do not want the police in my house stopping me doing calculus. I do it every night. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. You get, you get the point. I get the point, It's yeah. not actually – it's not like something you can localize that way. It's right. not yeah. like nuclear weapons where you can, like, trace, like, you know – <clears throat> you know, radioactive signatures and, and you, right. can, you have to find, and you can find like this, you know, like the expertise. It's not like that. Like, you know, even, even high school students can do this stuff now. I right. mean, so it's not like it's, it, it's so everyone's going to be able to do it. We can't control it. That's how um, really transformative technology tends to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what this is. And so, um, so we're going to have to think through about that. Now, now here's a, yeah. give an analogy though. We can still learn from other technologies. Like, you know, um, it was before I entered school, but you know, maybe the generation before me is a generation in which calculators entered the general mm -hmm. circulation, right. right? And there's a big debate about that because people worry what that would do to mm -hmm. elementary school kids in their education, because they, all of them were learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, now arithmetic was this trivial thing that you could just put into a calculator and do. And so there's debates about whether or not we should be even teaching arithmetic still. And, um, and then also, should we allow students to actually use a calculator or not? Right. And when do we allow them to do it? And what we settled on, for the most part, there are exceptions, but I think the right move was to say, yeah, actually, students probably do need to keep on learning arithmetic. <laughs> Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons that have to do with their formation because right. education yeah. is about formation mm -hmm. yeah. even more than about skills development. Right. And so it's part of their formation to do that. And, and because calculators interfere with that formation, there's periods in their education. Like, you know, my, mm -hmm. my eight-year-old second grader is learning, you know, how to do, you know, long multiplication for the first time. <laughs> He's not going to be able to use a calculator at all, except for to maybe check his work, right? Right. Yeah. And that's that's uh, that's what we kind of learned, right? Mm -hmm. And and we've figured that out. And we navigated to the point. It's not really that controversial. Calculators yes. are not that controversial because we navigated that. So what we're dealing with now is um, a whole bunch of things that a calculator couldn't do that now ChatGPT can. So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, where you know, like the sorts of essays that I had to do in high school or take home essays to kind of write um, like a, like a five-page essay or whatever, ChatGPT can do that. Right. And so now what do we do? It's <laughs> this exact same problem. It's interfering with formation. Like no one's asking high school students to write essays because they might win the Pulitzer Prize or something. We're doing that because we're wanting to learn how to think better, how to compose their thoughts and communicate it better. Right, yeah. And, and ChatGPT is kind of like a calculator in arithmetic. It interferes mm -hmm. with your ability to kind of learn that. And so we're having to think about how to use this well. Mm -hmm. And it has to be more. Uh, and so, like, if you have kids and if you even think about yourself, we have to think about more than how does it get our, get our tasks done quicker. We also have to think about how does it form us in the right. best way. Well, and that's where, you know, your, the description of being formed, I just kind of recognize it's like that's what, as a church, we should, the, inside the church, we should be incredibly concerned or not concerned, thoughtful about that because, you know, we are – made a new creation, but it we are forming our character to align with that of Christ. It's not easy. It's There's some things that may work out easily when you do it, but there's 
f character formation issues that I've been wrestling with for 40 years and I'm still working on. And so I, I just, I think I've, I, I would, I want to encourage, and I'm I found it a little disconcerting that I don't find a lot of this discussion in the church of how do we form character in there. And I think it would be an encouragement. It's like, I would love to see as a society, we kind of adopt a Christian view of this. That's kind of my, my pie in the world dream, if you will. But in the church, we we ought to be talking about these sorts of things. How do we use this technology? But also, how do we, if we're going to use the technology, there were character formation that went in there. How do we make sure we're forming character as well? Question about that in terms of our formation. People like C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, they were at times quite critical of technology. C.S. Lewis didn't think you should use a typewriter. He thought it interfered <laughs> with your capacity to, to write and to hear in your own mind what you were writing. But this, this question, I think, does come to bear. I mean, I know people that touch their cell phone 200, 300 times a day. I spend hours on this laptop. Is there, does it rob my humanity to some degree? Uh, what, I know there are going to be real advantages, but will it change human beings in the future? Well, you're basically a cyborg now. You're, <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of married to some computers, right? No, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, it, it does alter uh, the human experience in mm -hmm. pretty foundational, important ways that, um, that are hard to escape. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's actually a very good metaphor for sin <laughs> technology. Um, sin, I mean, technology isn't actually intrinsically evil. I mm -hmm. mean, we can use it either way, but it has uh, this sort of thing where once technology is kind of released, it's very hard to kind of put it back in Pandora's box. Right. And uh, once it becomes part of your life, it's hard to imagine a life without it. Like, how mm -hmm. do you imagine? I mean, you could do it. Like, we could all, like, kind of forswear our phones and, and electricity and all that sort of stuff. We could, I mean, in principle, we know it's possible. We also know it's impossible. We're not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's really changed in fundamental ways what it means right. to be human. Now, I think um, there's a couple things in the Christian faith that help with that. One of that is that I think um, our faith in a, some fundamental ways is a type of transhumanist sort of faith in the sense that we don't really believe that our current form is our final form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that what we see as human right now is not actually the final best expression of what it means to be human. Uh, that that's going to happen in, in you know in heaven, right. and it's going to be something that's going to be continuous with where we are. But also, it's going to be a break from this too. Yeah. And so that means that we should actually be able to kind of enter these sorts of change with a bit more open mindedness and mm -hmm. to, to see that and see the good to celebrate that, and also see the bad to find ways to mitigate it. Right. And so, um, so I think that 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 transhumanist component of Christianity. Now, to be clear, it's not transhumanism by technology in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not that type of secular transhumanism that doesn't really work with Christianity. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about just this idea that, that you know, we're going to be transformed when, yeah, we're, when, we're, right. when we come back. Well, and I think a, a critical component of that, that especially as a scientist and many of the scientists is like, just as a general rule, we're not the best at relationships. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a very blanket statement, but compared to other. But one of the things that I've found, and you know, I just Wait, look at I, it. I think you're pretty good at relationships, Jeff. You, you, can, you can thank my mom <laughs> for that. <laughs> because she's, I mean, I, I look at a lot of my tendencies, and I would be very anti-relational. And she worked really hard to make sure I've got good relational skills. But, you know, one of the things I think... You know, in one of our earlier conversations we were having about being made in God's image is God is inherently relational. And that's one of the questions I'm, I'm learning to ask about these technologies is, do, am I using this to enhance my relationships or is the way I'm using this a detriment to my relationships? So, yes, I can call my mom and FaceTime and do stuff over the phone. But I can very easily make it to where my interactions with people in my family that are in my house I do over the phone or do I go talk with them? You know, so it's like just asking those little questions. I'm, I'm trying to learn how to do that where it's like, am I building my relationships by being with and present with the people or am I using this tool to decrease my relationships? Yeah, so I think that that's a helpful point. I mean, I think we're, we're also parents. I think mm -hmm. one of the issues we have to think through is like, what is the right time, for example, to intrude our kids to social media? Right. Um, or to, to let them have a phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, I mean, I, I'm honestly, like my family, we're pretty biased towards having it later in life. You know? <laughs> like I don't, I don't 
think our kids are going to have cell phones in junior high, or, and, and you know, I mean, like like a smartphone where they can go on right. the internet, like maybe maybe like a like an emergency phone or something. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it'll be different, but but when I kind of think about where our set point is, mm-hmm. we're, we're actually not thinking about having them have access to them much later than I think is typical right now. So I think well, that, just, just from a practical measure, it gives them access to stuff that many times I know most middle schoolers can't handle. And so they're, they're just from a trying to limit the immediate access to some of that sort of stuff. But the flip side of that is, that, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's like, as I thought more and more about it, especially with my later kids, it's like I've had them given it to them or I provided a phone later. But I'm also recognizing I can't just say, well, we're going to avoid it as long as possible. It's like I have to be preparing them to have the maturity to use it well. As, yeah, yeah. Or else when they do get it out or when they move, they move out of my house, they could be in for a very rude awakening and some big problems if I haven't prepared them well for it. Yeah, now, yeah. Now here's a, a worldview question. Um, When we think about this, um, some people might look at artificial intelligence and say, see, human beings can create an artificial intelligence, and maybe that supports my my secular view. Mm. But, But my question would be, it seems to me we've recruited some of the brightest, best thinkers in the world to put us in a position where we can potentially create an artificial intelligence. That sounds like creation to me. (laughs) I mean, so the thing about it is that it's not creation ex nihilo. It's like out of other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, and and we're we're, modeling it after what we already see works, if you will. I mean, we're modeling a lot of our AI stuff after the way the human body works and the human mind works. Well, it's some it's level. inspired in some way. Inspired, it's it's yeah. like a mix of engineering. I mean, it, it, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it, you know, the originally is inspired by, you know, uh, you know, the human brain. But um, wh- what was the question? And you lost me with that. Side <laughs> Sorry. <part. laughs> this, this issue, I mean, I've often said um, the scientific community is fascinating to me. They recruit very bright people, give them highly specialized training, but so many of them come to the conclusion, well, there's no intelligence behind the universe. Well, in this context, we're looking at some kind of creation of artificial intelligence, but it's coming already from a very intelligent source. Well, yeah, but I mean, when it comes to the universe, I mean, obviously I believe that God created everything, including the mm-hmm. universe, and I think he's, in, I think he's intelligent. So, and that, I guess yeah. I believe in, and in, 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 I mean, he had forethought, if that's what you mean by it. So, I guess I believe in intelligence design on that level. <laughs> but there's also um, pretty significant disanalogies between um, the creation of the universe and the creation of AI. I mean, you know, one is being created by God, one's mm-hmm. being created by us. That's a pretty big disanalogy. Mm-hmm. Another big disanalogy is that. Um, that we've actually observed directly the process, like with our own two eyes. I mean, I've been part of that process. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people have been a part of the process of actually saying that these are the people. We give you the names. There's like this paper trail mm-hmm. of all the people that were involved in actually building this and doing that. We don't have anything comparable to that <laughs> in 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 the process that God used to create the universe, right? I mean, the closest thing is kind of like inspired text, but that's not that's not really the same thing. So these are big disanalogies, I would say, and that's. Um, and that, that's, that's part of why I think there ends up being a, a different sort of epistemological um, answer that's made. By now, people. do you think the image of God gives us the capacity to, you know, create machines that extend our reach, so to speak? Would, would you say that fits with the image of God in a Christian context? Yeah, I mean, certainly no other animals we can really imagine creating, <laughs> mm-hmm. creating you know, an AI, right? Is that uh, human exceptionalism? <laughs> I mean, human exceptionalism is pretty uh, – is kind of like the dominant view in science now. So, wow. I mean, like that's not, uh, that's not that surprising. Um, I mean, there's going to be debates about whether or not it includes Neanderthals or mm-hmm. not. But, but humans, we're, we're able to do stuff that other people can't. I mean, that's kind of undeniable. Um, but it turns out that while um, you know chimpanzees are probably persons, um, you know historically Christians would even say they probably had souls, but they're not human souls. Um, yeah. They they're, they have um, 
but and they're and you know we can't actually. I mean, they're not at the same level as us, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's actually a pretty big gap between their language abilities and ours. What we found out, and this is a very surprising thing in a lot of ways, that even though there's no animals that really have language that matches ours, it turns out that we can make machines that have language that surpasses ours. Yeah. <laughs> that's surprising. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, no, that, that's I mean, I would even say that you can find examples of philosophers, mainly Christian, but also non-Christians, that thought that that would be impossible unless the machine was sentient. And, and, and you'd either come down like, well, machines can't ever be right. sentient. But, I mean, it turns out that we, we didn't understand how language works. <laughs> well, that, that's one of the uh, question I have, and I'm curious your thoughts. I, my position is, no, it probably isn't. But do you think humans can create sentient, you know, artificial intelligence that is sentient? Or is that something uniquely reserved for humans? So I think the reality is, is that that's an I don't know from really every Fair, point. Okay. Of, I mean, so people, I think you might have great hope for it or great pessimism for it. Mm -hmm. But scripture doesn't ever speak to this directly. Um, and even if you're a, a Christian who thinks that, um, that humans can't create another mind um, other than through reproduction, mm -hmm. I mean, that's happening by, by, scripture says, by human decision, right? That's sort of not our intelligence. That's using a machine that's already built. But well, uh, people <laughs> being made, right? But yeah, so, so like, maybe with that exception somehow, but it's just analogous. Yeah, fair point, fair point. Okay. That, that we can't do it. Let's say you believe that. Um, well, who's to say that God can't um, um, in spirit or put the, in his image or mind within a machine that we've created? Mm. Interesting. Yeah, no, God, God th these are the fascinating theological questions that arise out of this discussion. And, you know, there's so. nothing in Scripture that says that, that, um, that God would never do that. <laughs> um, you know, Scripture is not even really telling us that humans are uniquely in the image of God. Many Christians have thought angels are in the image of God. And maybe if there's, you know, intelligent aliens, aliens right. they're in the image of God, too. So could uh, any of our machines be something that God endows with the image of God? Well, you know, I don't think we can know. Mm -hmm. We and we know that God does surprising things, right? <laughs> okay, now in a couple minutes, I want to encourage those listening. You can ask questions of our two scholars here about artificial intelligence. So you need to get into the chat. I have one more question I'd like you to address. What about the military issues? I mean, mm -hmm. I remember one of the original Star Trek episodes where you had these two groups of beings where uh, they were at war with each other, will there come a day where there'll be wars between the groups of artificial intelligence? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, but AI is already being deployed in, in warfare right now. Um, I think maybe the most helpful thing is to kind of raise the question of what are the applications that we as Christians should be the most concerned about? both because of um, the likelihood and potential for doing really damage, and maybe even that if we don't say something about some of these things, maybe no one will. Right. Um, and I would say the place that we should be really closely watching um, is um, the persecuted church outside the United States. Because right now, the, uh, the type of surveillance mm -hmm. right. of digital communications and things like that that this is enabling, is it, it's, it's – totally different. It removes a major bottleneck to kind of understand the stuff you have to have humans looking at. Yes. At, at like, you know, email trails and kind of putting these together. And, and that bottleneck is really, if it hasn't come down in practice, it is coming down in practice. Yes. And so, um, I mean, I worry about what's going to happen for Christians in China and mm -hmm. Christians in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are places where like the protections for uh, for, you know, uh, the protections for human rights and mm -hmm. checks and balances aren't there. Right. And so I, I worry about that. And I think that's something that we should be looking at really carefully about and realizing that there are far greater risks that really any of us are going to be ever in our lifetimes. Mm. That's a good point. No, I, I agree. It's, you know, talking to your AI amplifies. It's like, you know, I was recognizing reading an article about how they were using AIs to scan the faces of people at a concert and found this murder, you know, criminal that they were able to arrest. But on the flip side, you can use that same technology to, you know, you could say, okay, that's, that guy's a criminal, but oh, that guy's a Christian or a Muslim or whatever. It's like, it's the same technology. It's not like something different. It's like, you're going to use, it's going to be applicable both ways. And I, I agree the, 
that's something we ought to really watch. So Yeah, I mean, so like right now what's happening in the United States has really been limiting, like called advanced computer chips. That includes the GPUs that's really necessary to run this. And there's like strict controls about, hmm. about this that's kind of putting some limits on it in China. Mm-hmm. But those things, that's temporary too. I mean, that's yeah. eventually the, the they're going to gonna go, get there. Yeah, so, right. I mean, we, we, I mean, I don't know, pray about that. I mean, there, there could be real upticks in persecution in the actual persecuted church, not just right. the Christians that kind of mythologize and their own persecuted pathway. I mean, we don't yeah, really there, face, not per- much, not we don't face persecution yeah. here. <laughs> we face people looking at it askance and not liking what we said, and often because of our bad behavior. Yeah. So like, there, there that's people who are different. tortured, <laughs> thrown in jail. Yeah, really, truly persecuted, yeah. We've got a couple questions that have come in on the chat, so I want to encourage you. This is an opportunity to talk to two very qualified people to address this very interesting, fascinating subject. First question, it appears that there are pertinent ethical issues in a variety of fields, medical field, military, criminal justice, etc. How do we appropriately implement AI in these fields where the stakes are high? For example, remote surgery. Who has the responsibility if there is a malpractice? Software developer, factory, practitioner. Yeah, so right now, so you talk about, uh, so first of all, you're right that there are a lot of ethical questions mm-hmm. that come up. And the positive thing is that everyone recognizes that. And there's a lot of energy being put into how to navigate this well. And it really comes down to, I think, a question of good governance. And how do we actually set up structures, and know when we should be starting setting up structures or mm-hmm. using existing ones to actually kind of facilitate and do this in a good way? That's, that's like a larger conversation, which I have strong opinions on certain ways, but it's kind of a bigger conversation than right. this. Um, but the more specific thing that you brought up of um, a remote surgery, that's it's going to probably be a very long time before that's AI driven, that particular thing. Because typically remote surgery is done with an actual human surgeon kind of running it like a right. video, video game. And how you asked about um, how uh, the liability is handled, it, it turns out that that's actually worked out in that case, um, how, how that's been handled. So there's, there's ways to, to, you know, to build laws and insurance policies and things like that that actually you know, can compensate people when damage is done in a way that doesn't destroy businesses mm-hmm. and people for making innocent errors, but that also really punishes them yeah. for malpractice. All that can be done. It can be set up, and, and that's being worked out. I'm not as worried about that getting worked out. Um, the bigger issues are going to be, uh, I mean, the more the places where it's going to be seeing a lot more rapid use of it is both in image analysis. So that's something our group works on, mm-hmm. um, improving the way how pathologists are actually looking at pa- at, at slides, um, like you know, histo- like microscopic right. images of you know biopsies from patients and making determinations, yeah. and 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 also like you know uh, you know radiology, you know, looking at chest X-rays and CTs and things like that. That that's going to be one major area that's having a big impact, but the, but the other one too is in natural language processing. So mm-hmm. doing chart reviews and right. thinking through what the next steps are for a patient, all that sort of reasoning stuff. It, it's it's I mean it's coming in like a freight train right now. So is, is that the sort of thing where you can use the AI as a tool but not cede authority to it? Uh, you know, and what I'm what I'm saying there is that yes, having the AIs scan. X-rays and CT scans and fine pathologies, you know, it just never gets tired, never makes, you know, it's just, it's going to be consistent. But yet at the end of the day, you have the person that's making the decision of what's going on, you know. So it it seems to me that there's, we ought to have something like that in place. What are, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts since it's a little closer to what you do. So it really depends on the precise question. Okay. And exactly how it's being deployed. So it's very easy to imagine ways to deploy AI that would be very dangerous for patients. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But there's also ways to imagine, you know, deploying it in ways where there's safeguards against those dangers to the point where that's going to be very likely a big net benefit. Right. And so um, in, in the thing about it is that there's actually really good structures in place in medicine. And like I'm actually least concerned about the ethical implications in medicine uh, versus, you know, um, what's going on in tech companies. So tech companies don't actually have an ethical, uh, you know, tradition uh-huh. that they're drawing on. They don't 
That's you know, subscribe true. to the true. Hippocratic medical, oath. medical field does, yeah. They, they don't have the professional pride that we do that we're not going to harm patients. Yeah. Like, this is something that, that is, and, you know, I'm saying that as a physician, mm-hmm. but this is something that's far bigger than just physicians. That's even what the hospital administrators that have no right. medical training feel. That's also what the, what the nurses feel. Like, I mean, even if one, there's one bad apple there, actually getting away with doing harm to patients in that way would be very, very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's, it's a structure. It's an institution. Um, it's a culture. That's an interesting point. That promotes yeah. um, ethical behavior. Not that there isn't mistakes that are happening, but it right. even polices itself. And we're hard on the doctors yeah. and act and ethically. That's not going on in tech. Mm-hmm. Tech is like is like the wild west. They don't have um, they don't have those types of cultural controls. And so I'm really concerned what's going outside of medicine, and much more excited about what's going on in medicine. If that makes sense. <laughs> Here's another question: Does the advent of genuine general AI constitute a problem for the doctrine of the image of God? I think it poses questions for people with particular views of it. So um, there's, there are many Christians that have really connected language, for example, mm-hmm. to consciousness, to the image of God. That they, there's like just a tight bindedness to all of those things. And to the point that's why they would say things like you can't really have um, you know, you can't really have natural language processing or understanding without a mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, like I said, it, we were kind of showing by demonstration. Well, actually, you can have natural language at probably a higher level than even humans have it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's not – it doesn't have a mind. Yeah. Right. So, so that, that, that's not the way it works. So that, that does kind of call us back to this question of what it means to be human, what mm-hmm. is the image of God. Well, and, and I think these, are, these raise important theological questions because, you know – you know, I find with many uh, issues in theology, there's there's kind of a few, you know, at least some number of views around that, and it seems like as these new things come in, the question is, okay, I, I am convinced that we're never going to find anything that shows what God has revealed to be incorrect, but I'm con- also equally convinced that we find things we say, oh, we weren't thinking rightly about that, and so these sorts of things really do force some fascinating theological questions, but it does raise the challenge to Christians, and I think as a whole, we do this well, but individual Christians that we just need to know our theology well and, and to be interested in knowing our theology because it allows us to engage these conversations in the public much more effectively. Yeah, I mean, also, too, it depends what we mean by the, I mean, so if you know theology, you know that there's actually a really wide range of views on what the image of God is, right? So what I describe is a challenge or a question that one slice mm-hmm. of the church is working through. Right. Mm. But there's other slices of the church are like, ah, that's not a problem for me at all, right. because I don't think it has to do with those abilities. I think it has to do with God appointing uh, me as a representative, and he hasn't appointed mm-hmm. that computer program as that, so it's not an image of God, even though it has language, because it's not about that. <laughs> and so they're, yeah. they're, they're thinking about it very differently. And I would say that's I would act- say the fundamental issue is, do you have the capacity to relate to God? And there's nothing in these well, compu- AIs that seem to have that. You know, well, that's that's interesting. That's an interesting question. So, do they have the ability to relate with God? I'd say that if God wants to relate with them, He can. And okay, I don't know but that if, would be God putting His image in there, not us generating it. In, in my explanation, and conversely, of that. if God didn't want to have a relationship with us, I don't think we could have a relationship with Him. Yeah, indeed, that's a fair point. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's not even really so. So, but I mean, this is also once again an example of like, can you say? I mean, if God wanted to have a relationship, I mean, is there, there's nothing illogical about it. maybe you would want to and then they would have a relationship with god then what do you do yeah. <laughs> question from jimmy how does your view of the nature of mind affect the way you approach ai if the mind is irreducible to physical stuff what does that mean for ai research so I'll ask this question in the context of something we were we were talking about earlier is, you know, is is consciousness an emergent property? And, and by that I mean that, you know, you kind of just keep adding algorithms, you add more complexity, and eventually what we call consciousness emerges. Because uh, it seems like even now consciousness is something different than what the AIs are displaying. Um, I, I'm curious, do you think – that just adding more to will eventually result no, in No, I don't, I don't think you conscious don't. is going to come by merely making bigger models. Okay. I mean, maybe we'll get conscious machines in the future, but that's not going to be the whole story by any means. Okay. The, 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 he, he points to the idea as like, is the mind irreducible? Well, I think the mind is irreducible in the sense that you it's can't... It's irreducible bring, or it is reducible? It's irreducible. It's irreducible. In okay. the sense that it's not... I mean, like, 
you know, you, you know, it's it's either you know there there is a mind there, and if you kind of break it up into any sort of parts, it's no longer there. Right. So it's okay. not can't be reduced down to the parts. There's something happening that that emerges. Mm -hmm. About uh, be, you know, in a complex way that we can't even really fully specify, because anyone mm -hmm. who tells you they know how <laughs> consciousness works, once again, um, is not appreciating the depths of our uncertainty on these things, right? right? So I can, I, so in that sense, I agree with that. But the thing about it is that um, that in AI, we're finding out. I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff that it's doing that is irreducible in that precise way. Uh, not consciousness, but a lot of things that are irreducible. A lot of the features that it can do. Um, are, you know, if you take away, um, you know, a few of the parts, then they can't do it at all. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, and, and that's on several different ways of defining parts. And so it's irreducible in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we already know AI can produce, um, you know, can do things, do, do actions and abilities that are irreducible. Okay, so the mind may be irreducible, but there are other things that AI does that are irreducible, even if they're not the mind. So maybe... So that's not the reason why you couldn't have a mind. Off, yeah, okay. It, it might be you could put stuff together and eventually get a mind at some point. Yeah, in principle, but, maybe. But, but not those two are not necessarily connected, so... Yeah, so I think a, a better way to think about this is I think, um, I mean, there is some people who disagree, and I think they're wrong. Um, most people think they're wrong. But why is it that – why is it true that ChatGPT doesn't have a mind? And really kind of carefully thinking about that and giving a precise, coherent, and correct answer can be very helpful in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, so an example of one reason, which is a good way, reason to say that it doesn't have a mind – I'll give you two reasons actually. One is that it doesn't have an inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. We – I mean it's hard mm -hmm. to actually imagine a mind without an inner dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't have an inner dialogue. Okay. Um, the other thing, too, that's true is that it doesn't have a continuity of self. And Meaning, so it's, j just articulate what that means quickly. A continuity of self is that it kind of it, it, it has a sense of itself now and that's continuous with something that existed in the prior moment, oh, okay. the prior right. moment, okay. the prior moment, the prior moment. And so. Um, so I have a past and I can think about the future. That's not what. Yeah, these it, AIs do so. Yeah, they don't have any, so they're kind of being they're just like functions that are being executed on random computers across the globe, gotcha. right? Okay. And they don't have they're not embodied in a particular bounded place, and there mm -hmm. isn't that sort of sort of um, right. Philosophers uh, call it aboutness. You can think about things and consider well, them. the aboutness. I wonder if it does have. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it does, um, but it doesn't have. Like I said, it doesn't have the continuity of self, is what I'm saying. So I think mm. those two things alone. Or even one of those alone is probably right. enough for us to say it's not sentient. But here's the thing. Um, I told you that AI is not a single thing, right? Right. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not that hard to conceive of different technologies that are closely related to this that might start to kind of dismantle those objections. <laughs> Well, so let me ask kind of a, a related question to that because, yes, I agree that ChatGPT does a, a remarkable job with language. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what level, how high you could push it, whether it could produce novels of, you know, Pulitzer caliber, you know, th th that sort of writing. But it does seem at some level that uh, – even though it's doing language, it's kind of mimicking language at some level. And I, and I don't want to make that a hard distinction because I think there's a lot of things that it does very similar to how we do language. But specifically, you know, when, I, when I'm talking, I'm not sitting there thinking of the next word. I'm thinking of a thought and what's the best way to convey it to you. And it, it, as at least in my understanding of the, the, the various chatbots is that they're – Thinking, you know, basically thinking, what's the next word? What's the next word? What's the next word? And so it's 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 doing language in a way that I would say is very human, but it's doing it differently. Well, so it's true that it's doing it differently, but I think it's complicated because it turns out that you know humans learn language by mimicking. So are we? Are you just mimicking English to me and human language to me? Well, yeah, you are mimicking what you learned. <laughs> well, I, I was, but now I'm not. You know, and so. <laughs> I mean, I think what happened is you learned by mimicking and, uh, Fair, okay. and th that it got kind of encoded deeply in your neural networks to the point that, you know, it's just kind of part of – it's kind of baked into your brain right now. But that, that, that's, that's actually not that disanalogous from how it is with ChatGPT. No, and, and I think this is probably the distinction between 
the task and the sentience behind it or the task and the mind behind it. It's like I, I don't deny that, yes, I've learned language by mimic at some level at a very – probably a, a remarkably high level. I actually – I'd but say very my, similar to very how similar. Chat But with my mind, there's something else that's going on in there as well. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I don't think that – with the current iterations of ChatGPT, I mean, are there, there's going to be analogies mm -hmm. where maybe it is doing something similar, but there's also parts that you're getting at that, which I don't really think it is. I could be wrong. I don't think that's really it is. Um, but, I mean, it's complicated because, like, you're kind of telling me you have a thought, and that's the base of the way you're talking about it. But how do I know that? I can't actually see that in your brain. Uh, I can't image your brain to get what those thoughts are. I'm only getting the thought from you because you're telling me that. <laughs> You, right. You're telling me you formed the thought that that yeah. no one can see but you. So I have to take your word for it. And then you basically are trying to convey that thought. So there's no way for me to directly access the fact that you've actually kind of internally in your mind kind of created that thought. Right. Except for the fact that you're telling me about it, right? Well, well, but I would also rely on the fact that you, being human, largely think the same way. So I'm, I'm expecting that you would say, "Yes, I think thoughts or articulate ideas," and then I say the words. Yeah, but imagine it's an alien who's talking to you. Like the only way he could know that that's how you think is because you tell it. It's not because he can actually examine your brain to find <laughs> out. And that, but I'm just telling you that that's the problem we're dealing with chat right. GPT on because, like, you say it's not. I don't think that's how it's working. But there is actually a couple things in this actual architecture that are. Actually, a There's little bit analogous okay, to that. Fair, fair point. No, and this is and so it yeah. becomes trickier. Um, Question yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, One ahead. more. Let's let's get through them. Paul, is there a way to ensure that AI is fair and objective, not driven by a particular ideology? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think competition is a great starting point for that. So the fact so that competition the, and that multiple companies yeah. are making AI is not an AI is there's. It's not an individual or competition within an individual AI. It's competition amongst companies. Yeah, because, like, you know, Google has one. OpenAI has one. Yeah. Microsoft has the OpenAI one. I mean, like, that mm -hmm. competition, I think, is really good. And if it was just a single source for all of this stuff, I think, I think we should be very concerned about that. Yeah. But the fact that there's multiple, I think that's very protective. And, I think uh, we ought to watch that in the future because it seems like any sort of powerful tool, powerful technology, somebody's tried to monopolize at some point in time. So I, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see that in the future. Is, but is Google going to solve death? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless he finds – I mean, maybe they might help us become to more terms of the realities happening to everyone. <laughs> but, I mean, is that solving death? I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> Here's a question from Tara. Can AI be used to replace actors and actresses in movies, television, et cetera? The movie industry's union strike in 2023 was catastrophic. AI was a huge reason for the strike. Yeah, can. So there's like a can is one of those words that can mean a lot of things. Is it technically possible? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it legally possible um, that, you know, I think that there's been a uh, – in particular, the actors, I think they've really tried to make sure it's not legal to do that without actually kind of giving them royalties for their uh, for their images. So so this is replacing actors where you use the image of the actor, but it's not an actor. I could – I actually see a more likely scenario where you use AIs to produce, you know, avatar-type actors where there's – you know, there's an image associated, but it's not an actual person, but yet it looks lifelike. I, I – yeah, that, that doesn't that, strike me as too far off, given I mean, where we are. Well, to be clear, that was actually going on in a lot. Of, so there's um, uh, Sailor Moon. I don't know if you ever I, heard I of that. I remember the term. So it's a I Japanese heard, yeah. pop star that's actually just an anime figure. <laughs> you, right. Um, it's kind of created by a team of people. It's not AI, but it's not a person. It's like a. Um, it's kind of like this, you know, animated mm -hmm. pop star yeah. in Japan and. If you look up Sailor Moon, you'll understand what I mean. Right, yeah. it, it's kind of a, a pretty weird thing in a lot of ways, right? But that sort of thing is actually very plausible to imagine being created by AI. Right, yeah. And um, and I think you could make it, you know, photorealistic or you know, yeah. but it looks real world. So I, I don't. I, I agree that you know, using you know, you get Arnold Schwarzenegger done by an AI. I think that's problematic, but. Yeah, I mean, we're Swartz not. So I'd say we're not there yet um, yeah. in doing like the fully AI actor thing. Um, and a more likely thing is going to be kind of like more of an evolution of mm -hmm. kind of from current CGI things having more and more taken over by right. AI. That makes sense. Um, yeah. 
Another question, Kirby, does AI make Ray Kurzweil's concept of the computer singularity more realistic? So what, what did Kurzweil mean that by 2050, they can take the intelligence out of our body and put it on a computer screen? What, 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 do you think that's realistic? Do you think that will happen? Well, so, I mean, let's talk about what the singularity is that he's talking about. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, almost like a quasi-religious, technologically based thing where it's not about God. I mean, most people mm -hmm. that are in, into the singularity are atheists, um, but it's almost like an eschatology. It kind of functions yeah. almost like a theological belief that th technology will advance some, uh, to this incredible point at which uh, we'll all be able to live forever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, when you look at the image they have, it really is like an image of, of like heaven that they're kind of constructing. Right? <laughs> right. I mean, so that's why I'm saying it's like quasi-religious. It's really They've got an eschatology, a, a hope, a focus. Yeah, and the idea is that, you know, technology advanced to the point where you actually can take the, our mind and kind of put it in the computer. And that's how we'll actually uh, we'll either be in robots that can, you know, live forever mm -hmm. and bounce between that or – or, um, or you know, maybe in some sort of virtual world. And you can see this in, in you know, in science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't actually see it yet in real life, right? Um, does it make – does AI make that idea of singularity more realistic? I mean – I would say it's very unrealistic to think that technology could get us there. But mm -hmm. there are certain barriers that we thought would make it unrealistic that maybe are not really there mm -hmm. anymore. But there's so many other barriers yeah, <laughs> that um, it's hard to – I mean, like, the key thing here is, like, you know, I think everyone would think twice about entering – if we really did make the Star Trek transporter mm -hmm. that disassembles you, <laughs> kind of vaporizes you – here and kind of just turns you into bits of information, sends that over a distance, and it gets, gets rematerialized over there. I mean, everyone should think twice about whether or not they want to step into that transporter, right? Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> is it really you that's coming out of the other, the other end of this? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it's the death of you and the creation of a copy of you. That's interesting, yeah. And so I think really that's like one of these kind of fundamental things where I think that if you think clearly about this, it's really hard to evade that problem mm -hmm. where um, really what's going on with the singularity is they, they, there's not really – they have not really proposed any sort of technology that can show us how you can take mm -hmm. consciousness out of our of, of us and put it somewhere else – yeah. That yeah. isn't like right, yeah. just making a copy of us. That's not us. Like it's a copy of you. It's not you. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I, what I find is that there's a lot of things about our science fiction and our movies, media, whatever you want to call it, that makes this stuff seem – almost expected and commonplace. I mean, you know, traveling amongst the stars. Of course we're going to figure that out someday. And I don't know that we're ever actually going to figure it out because that's incredibly challenging just from a physics perspective. But it seems plausible. It seems like this is this falls into that class is that we're solving more and more things that seem like there are problems. And it's okay at some point in time we're going to get it. But at the end of the day, it's an assumption that people are making that the more we do, as we continue to increase, we're going to figure out how to do that. And it may just be something that's entirely impossible to do. I, I think from a quantum mechanics perspective, I don't think you can transport people. Out. I mean, yeah, I think there may be some fundamental physics limitations on that. Question from <laughs> Timothy. Does the old adage applied to computers 30 years ago, garbage in, garbage out, apply just as much to the present state of AI? Um. I mean, so yes and no. I mean, so a lot of AI, that's true. But I'd say what's going on in large language models is different because it's certainly being fed a lot of garbage. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily garbage out. It just might know what garbage is and to avoid it. So a, a great example of this is like you can meet a person who never cusses and never swears, right? But it doesn't mean that they've never learned the, all those swear words and cuss words. Maybe they're able to avoid cussing and swearing because they actually learned them really well so they know to avoid them, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So... And it doesn't mean they've never read it and they've never seen it in a movie theater, just the fact that they don't actually put it out of their mouths. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> so yeah. I think that you can see that happening all the time with ChatGPT where there's stuff in the um, 
in the like so you'll see racist stuff in the training material, but that doesn't mean that ChatGPT will say something racist. It knows what racism is. It knows what racist is. You can tell it we want you to be like a friendly person that's not racist, and it won't tell you racist things. <laughs> so, um, so it so that's different thing. I mean, that kind of shows it could be garbage in, but not necessarily garbage out. I, I think you could make an argument though that that's part of even in the training set there is training in there that allows that distinction. So I, I don't know that it's something new and unique coming out. That, but I, I mean, I, 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 I agree with your point. I think that may be part of just the training that's in there, that it's just a complex enough training that it gets masked as I can put junk in and not get junk out. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. I want to raise this important question. How can we use AI in our conversation to build a bridge to the gospel? Reasons to believe, a very significant part of reasons to believe is using science as a tool to point mm -hmm. people to Christ. I know on you, you as a person, you care a lot about evangelism and apologetics. How can you use AI to, to, to build a bridge? Well, I mean, I think one of the really exciting things about this moment is that a lot of people are talking about AI, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and it's yeah. and, it, and it's yeah. and it's a topic that's deep. It's not like like everyone's right. talking about the Lakers, right? I mean, the Lakers are great, but you know, there's a certain amount of depth you get to with that, and it's also a bit more localized. This is different. This is like a like a worldwide right. conversation yeah. that's happening. Yeah, that's bringing us to questions about the nature of the soul, mm -hmm. the nature of the mind, and all the uh, the image of God. And and so these are conversations that Christians should be really you know pleased to be part of and right. participate in. And mm -hmm. even though we're going to be with a lot of people who don't always agree with us, that's great. We should do that. And I think what we can be doing is really trying to find our voice uh, in a way that kind of echoes C.S. Lewis, where you know when uh, you know kind of presented with particular possible challenges to the faith, he kind of plays with them. Like, mm -hmm. So he like you know people used to call you know the idea of intelligent aliens a major. You know, demonstration that Christianity isn't true. Of course, we hadn't actually seen any intelligent right. aliens yet. So, like well, the way how most Christians were responding to it is like very naturally, kind of just being very negative about that possibility. Yeah. Oh, we're never going to find it, and so we shouldn't even think about that. And they're all wrong. It's not actually that. Well, you know, C.S. Lewis, he kind of he said, well, who knows? Maybe, maybe there is. And he wrote he wrote novels about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and he he said, you know, maybe. Well, this is how I'd make sense of it if actually mm -hmm. if that if that were true. And I think right. that's the sort of Mm -hmm. Engage in that kind of open, um, unthreatened sort of uh, trying to make sense of the world alongside people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would just echo what you say is, you know, if I have to, if I've got these two or three arguments or something I want to talk about, now I have to figure out how to get the conversation around to something that connects to that. <laughs> Whereas if I realize, hey, AI is just ripe with science faith connections in there. People are talking about AI. I don't have to get them interested in that. I can just j join in the conversation they're already having. And what does it mean to have a soul? Are these things really human or not? I mean, they're kind of non-threatening and just real open for bringing the gospel in pretty quickly. If you, I mean, if you really and I'd say that the Christian, that mere Christianity doctrine of the fall. Mm -hmm is a very salient way yes. to think about Agreed. technology. Agreed. <laughs> and while, you know, iPhones are not in the Bible and it doesn't talk about computers, it does talk about technology and the impact yeah. it has on society and, and culture. Like that's like one of the dominant themes of Genesis. Right. And, so, and as you say, yeah. we're, we, are we are asking the question, what does it mean to be a human being? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is the good life? <laughs> yeah. What, and what is it to be good? What is the good life? Uh, Josh, how... Uh, Mention the title of your book. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book called The Genealogical Adam and Eve. Okay. That's on. That's the human origin stuff, right? right. And, and people can get that on Amazon. Yeah. What about how can people contact you at Peaceful Science? Yeah, if you go to Peaceful Science, there's a contact form. It's not that hard to find my email online, too. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's some stuff in the works where, where reasons to believe in us are likely to be working, you know, together on some stuff, maybe mm -hmm. even putting some conferences on together. So let me leave some opportunities for you guys to join us on those too. Right. Great. Jeff, that book moving along on? Uh, yeah, it's, I got to kind of do some corrections on it and get it going, okay. but I think it's a fascinating topic. And... Well, very good. Uh, I want to thank all of you for watching this webinar, listening to it. Uh, we are going to continue on this theme. We're going to have other people who represent science faith organizations. And again, I want to I want to bring you back to this idea of treating other people's beliefs the way you want yours treated. It doesn't mean you have to accept them, 
but it means you're, you work hard at being fair. You work hard at being accurate. And most of all, you're charitable in the way that you interact with them. And so I hope that you'll stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have uh, more to come. And Josh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for participating in this webinar. No, yeah, this is fun. We could <laughs> go on for a couple more hours, right? <laughs> yeah, so thanks. Jeff, thank you. Uh, you're working and writing in this field, and I've appreciated being able to talk to you about it. It has been fun, so thank you. All right. Thanks again. Continue to, to support Reasons to Believe and to uh, learn more about us.